This is less than 1903, the French Revolution. The old regime, otherwise known as the Ancien Regime, pre-1789. How did the events of 1789 result in a constitutional monarchy in France? And what were the consequences? Of course, we're going to spend several lessons trying to answer that question. And College Board Topic 5.4 is entitled The French Revolution. Explain the causes, events, and consequences of the French Revolution. And it says the French Revolution resulted from a combination of long-term social and political causes as well as enlightenment ideas exacerbated by short-term fiscal and economic crises. We're going to address all of that. Our time frame is basically pre-1789 France. I have used many different sources for these lessons on the French Revolution, but I want to give a special recognition to Living the French Revolution and the Agent of Napoleon by Professor Suzanne Dazan. You can listen to this book from audible.com. It's well worth it. Welcome to by far the longest of the lessons of the entire school year, the French Revolution. You deserve to know why this series of lessons is so long. The immensity of the French Revolution has been a source of frustration for both history teachers and students. Before making this series, I had taught about the French Revolution for several years. I never felt that I was doing justice to this pivotal moment in Western history. The various elements and events and concepts just weren't connecting for me or the students. They were just happening in isolation from each other. And I was determined to do something about that frustration no matter what it took. I realized that a logical, orderly, connected narrative was going to have to go deep if the students were to truly get their heads around what happened and why it was so important. And the French Revolution happened just as the world was about to change in huge ways. So it's fitting that our semester ends with the French Revolution. Every lesson we have learned this semester is going to feed into this French Revolution and be necessary for understanding it. And many times in these lessons, I'm going to remind you, we studied this concept or this person in lesson such and such. At the end of this unit, you're going to know more about the French Revolution and you're going to understand it better than the vast majority of high school advanced history teachers. There's almost no limit to how deep you can go in your study of the French Revolution. And this series is what I believe to be the bare minimum if you really want to understand the French Revolution and all the issues that it touches. Finally, I've taken steps to make all of this easier for you to digest. The pre-made notes concentrate only on the most important highlights. We have the screen recording version to go with the slides. My suggestion is to get the big picture by listening to or watching the video and then making your notes with the slides. Take these lessons in stages. The great thing about recordings and slides is that you can pause, rewind, take a break, come back later, play it again, etc. When we look at the various topics and developments of the French Revolution, we want to ask three things. Number one, what caused this development? It didn't just happen. Number two, what effect did this development have on the next development? It didn't happen in isolation either. And number three, what does it tell us about the overall nature of the French Revolution? Just look at these topics that fit within the French Revolution. Teachers, all teachers have to teach all of these, and they are many. Let's just make a quick list. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, privilege, the Ancien Regime, the Enlightenment, the Three Estates, the Bourgeoisie, the French Colonies, the American Revolution, the Economic Crisis, the Estates General, the National Assembly, the Bastille, the Great Fear, the March on Versailles, the October Days, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, political clubs, the Catholic Church, women in the Revolution, the King's Flight, foreign reactions to the French Revolution, the Declaration of Pilnitz, the Brunswick Manifesto, the overthrow of the monarchy, and that's just the French Revolution. That's not the French Republic or Napoleon. And these are all concepts that all European history teachers valiantly attempt to cover in a very short time. And if you try to learn about all of these in just a couple of lessons, it's going to be a frustrating mess. I've been there. So now it's time to actually get into French history, the intro.
what happens when a people who are entrenched in, number one, traditional monarchy like France, and number two, hierarchical society like France, try to invent, number one, modern democratic politics, and number two, an egalitarian society. See, those are opposites of each other. How do you go from old to modern at lightning speed? We're going to see historical developments happening so fast that it's going to make your head spin. You know, we normally think of history in terms of years and decades, but in the French Revolution, events can unfold in weeks, days, and even hours. Here are the big themes that we will return to again and again. Number one, politics, of course. All the different kinds of political structures that came out of the French Revolution. Constitutional monarchy, representational democracy, dictatorship by committee, conservatism, authoritarian one-man rule, the sudden creation of a huge republic, 25 million people, the turning of the largest and most populous monarchy in Europe into a democracy, and going from having one absolute monarch to having literally thousands of political participants. Number two, the impact upon French daily life. How do you remake a people who had always had very few rights, suddenly into rights-bearing citizens and equals? The abolition of the aristocracy and feudalism, the taking away of lands and power from the church, the eventual attempt to remove the church completely from French life. The French Revolution asked the big questions of rights and equality for the first time in Europe, including rights for women and including the rights of slaves and all free people of color. There was a newness and a radicalness to the French Revolution. People in Europe were very aware that some fundamental assumptions about their world had broken and a new world was emerging, which is going to turn out to be our modern world. And it was going to impact the lives of every man, woman, and child in France. It was going to impact the lives of every man, woman, and child in the French colonies. It was going to radically change what everybody thought about such things as God and church and king and social hierarchy and privilege and slavery. And then... And this kind of goes beyond the scope of just the French Revolution. It gets into the French Republic and Napoleon. But then the French and Napoleon were going to export all of these changes in thinking well beyond France. And that leads us to really the third theme, and that is that the French Revolution had international significance. It generated international excitement. It sparked 23 years of Europe-wide, nearly nonstop war. French revolutionaries wanted to conquer new territory on behalf of their new revolution. They expanded France's borders. They created sister republics. And this created difficult questions for people. Like, what was the relationship between having democracy and equality at home and colonizing oppressed enslaved people abroad, whether they wanted to be colonized or not? Or the relationship between having a democracy and equality at home and imposing those same values upon people that you have conquered. So we begin with Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And in Lessons 12.5 and 15.2, we saw how French kings had methodically enlarged their territory through conquest, heredity, and marriage. And we also saw how all those guys had worked really hard to build a powerful bureaucracy around themselves in France. And we saw kings like Charles the Seventh and Louis the Eleventh, the Spider King, and Louis the Twelfth, and Francis the First and Louis the Fourteenth. In theory, the power of the French king was absolute. He made the law. For example, on one occasion Louis the Sixteenth defended the legality of one of his actions by saying, It is legal because I will it. But we also learned in Lesson 15, too, that the absolute power that French kings had was never really entirely absolute. The king was bound by his religious conscience, and there were certain laws that were so fundamental that even the king himself couldn't go against them. For example, he couldn't pass the crown to a female heir. The church supported the king, 
We learned about divine right of kings in lessons 15.2 and 15.5. The French king got his authority directly from God, a Catholic God, not a Protestant God. And the king was himself the father of his people. And this idea of divine right of kings was legitimized by such thinkers as Jean Baudin and Bishop Jacques Benin Bossuet from lesson 15.5. We studied them. And the kingship was considered sacred and eternal. Every French king eventually died, but in a way, every French king lived forever in the persons of his heirs. And it was even thought that the French king could heal certain illnesses just by touching you. But something was starting to slip, even before the French Revolution. For example, in the ritual of giving the royal touch that I just mentioned, the king would always make the sign of the cross on the person's forehead and say these words, The king touches you. God heals you. Well, Louis XV, who was Louis XVI's grandfather, Louis XVI's father died in 1761 before becoming king, he had actually stopped performing the royal touch entirely. But Louis XVI, he went back to doing it, but he did change the wording of it slightly. He changed it to this, the king touches you, may God heal you. And you can hear just a little bit of doubt in that subtle change, putting the word may in there. At Louis XVI's coronation ceremony, some of his advisors suggested that he just skip the more superstitious stuff, like the anointing of the sacred oil. Why did they suggest this? Well, in Lessons 16.3 and 16.4, we learned about the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment had encouraged people to question everything, including the vine right of kings, including all of that, quote, superstition. And instead, the Enlightenment had proposed things like science and data and a social contract. And in Lesson 16.5, we saw how monarchs like Frederick II and Catherine the Great and Maria Theresa and Joseph II all become what you call enlightened absolutists? Well, Louis XVI wasn't that into the Enlightenment. He was certainly not an enlightened absolutist. He liked Enlightenment ideas about improving and reforming society, but he didn't see himself in terms of the Enlightenment at all. Instead, Louis XVI saw himself as the guardian of traditional values and institutions like privilege and royal authority and hierarchy and the church and aristocracy. Louis XVI had an unassuming personality. He was quiet. Uh, he enjoyed hunting, enjoyed tinkering with clocks. He was popular with the French people, but he was indecisive to an absolute fault. Louis XVI's wife was Marie Antoinette, and she was from Austria. She was one of the Empress Maria Theresa's 16 or so kids, and her brother was the Austrian Emperor Joseph II. Marie Antoinette had left her home in Austria to marry Louis XVI at the age of only 14, and in fact, Louis himself was only 15 at the time. And it was hoped that this marriage would strengthen this relatively new and uneasy alliance between France and Austria. And we saw this unlikely alliance between these two old rivals form in less than 1605, just before the Seven Years' War. Marie Antoinette had almost no education. Nobody felt like it was necessary to give more than a very basic education to young princesses. And she felt socially very uncomfortable being at the Palace of Versailles all around all of these sophisticated, older, high-ranking officials and all of these complex political factions. She was a foreigner in another country. She was isolated from her family. And as a result, Marie Antoinette didn't patronize the wide range of events and functions and relationships that a queen was expected to. And she often kept just a tight circle of friends around her, holding parties just for them. And she insulated herself from most of the other members of society. And this contributed to Marie Antoinette's lack of popularity among the people.
Marie Antoinette's often made fun of by historians for having a Hamlet custom built just for her at the edge of the palace grounds at Versailles. And this thing was professionally designed. It had about 10 buildings, including a stove room and a windmill and a working dairy and a barn and gardens. It had its own live-in staff and guards. And Marie Antoinette gets criticized for spending a lot of time out there with her children, quote, playing milkmaid and pretending to be a simple country peasant. But here's what she said about that private hamlet. There, I can be myself. I mean, do you hear the pain in that? Wouldn't you need a place to escape to in order to just live simply and clear your mind of all of the turbulence and the overwhelming complexity of the French court? But all of these things made Marie Antoinette look cliquish and aloof and distant. Also, Marie Antoinette could never be forgiven by the French people for being Austrian. Part of her function in France was to promote and further this unnatural alliance between France and Austria. But Austrian Habsburgs and the various French dynasties had been enemies for centuries, going at least all the way back to the age of Reformation. And the French people, they didn't like Austrians. And this alliance was very unpopular in France. And Marie Antoinette's own husband, the king, Louis XVI, didn't believe in this French-Austrian alliance. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette had four kids, two died in infancy, and it took them seven years to have their first child. Louis XVI had some kind of physical problem, which has never been definitively identified, but the problem was corrected by minor surgery, but it took Louis XVI seven years to agree to have the surgery. He was that indecisive. And in those seven years, the royal couple were ridiculed incessantly about having no kids. And Louis XVI never kept mistresses like all of his predecessors had, which people thought said something about his masculinity and his maturity. And all of this also contributed to Marie Antoinette's unpopularity. Marie Antoinette had a reputation for extravagant spending, immoral behavior, and for political meddling. And there were all kinds of scandals at court that were not her fault, but that tarnished, tarnished her image anyway. You can Google the diamond necklace affair of 1785 as one example. And there was all kinds of what we might call today fan fiction about her supposed intrigues and affairs with both men and women. And these rumors reflected badly back on the king, Louis XVI, because they made him look weak and inept, because he couldn't seem to get control of his wife or his court. So how could he be expected to run France? Why are all of these stories about Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette relevant to our understanding of the French Revolution? Because it all shows that attitudes towards privilege, aristocracy, and royalty were becoming more critical in the 1780s. The unconditional reverence that people had for the nobility was slipping away. Common people were becoming dissatisfied with all of the wealth and privilege and bad behavior of the nobility. And maybe they were even starting to question the absolute power of the king. How could these people deserve so many rights and privileges. Let's talk more about this concept of privilege in the Ancien Regime. Just the word privilege makes a great essay term and a great essay topic. Privilege referred to a person's special status before the law. And privilege was at the heart of French social hierarchy. Hierarchy had been around forever. Hierarchy was considered natural. The king was over his subjects, lords were over their peasants, men were over women, masters were over their slaves, clergy were over the lay people. It was everywhere. And privilege ensured that inequality would be highly structured in French society and woven into the fabric of existence.
privileged determined all kinds of things about your life in France. It determined what kinds of taxes you paid, if at all, where you sat in church, whether you could carry a weapon, what kind of clothes you could wear, what kind of dues and tithes you owed. But now, new ideas were being widely accepted in France, and these new ideas were creating tension between the old system of privilege and a new emerging society. French society under this hierarchical system of privilege. French society was divided into three what were called estates. So what is an estate? Well, just the word estate refers to a state of being. It's like Spanish, como estás, and estoy bien, right? How is it? It is well. Estates were arranged like this. There were three. The first estate was the clergy. Second estate was the nobility. And the third estate was the other, at least 95% of the population of France. In other words, the third estate was everybody who was not nobility or clergy. How can we describe this critical third estate? Well, only the third estate paid any taxes or any import duties, etc. The third estate consisted mostly of rural peasants, about 80% of the third estate. Some peasants owned their own land, most rented their land from noble land-owning aristocrats. These nobles had the legal right to collect all kinds of dues and payments and services from their peasants. Peasants paid dues for practically everything they used that their lords owned. And these obligations were recorded in documents that most peasants couldn't even read. But there was also an incre increasing number of people called the bourgeoisie in the third estate. These were doctors and lawyers and merchants and slave traders, bankers, government officials, etc. They were wealthy and urban. They were educated and skilled. Many were getting extremely wealthy from the phenomenal growth in global trade and colonial trade that France was engaged in. And they represented a new kind of hierarchy in France, the hierarchy of wealth, rather than the old hierarchy of privilege. Remember from Lesson 18.3 that there was a huge consumer revolution going on in Europe. Global commerce grew four times in France during the 18th century, and colonial commerce grew 10 to 15 times during the 18th century in France. Coffee, and the French spent more money on coffee than they did on cheese, which is amazing because the French eat a lot of cheese. Sugar, exotic fabrics, porcelain, carpets, furniture, wigs, stockings, gold watches, fans, umbrellas, handkerchiefs, snuff boxes, and thousands more consumer goods and commodities were made, imported, bought, and sold in this new global economy. Most of the economic growth in France was in the sections of trade and commerce rather than in agriculture or manufacturing. Farmers didn't get to experience this growth unless they grew cash crops, crops not for eating but for selling. Nobles tended not to want to get their hands dirty with all of this commerce and if you got too far into commerce, you could just wind up losing your noble title. So, in the French cities, great wealth existed side by side with great poverty, and new wealth existed side by side with old aristocratic privilege. And this was, by its very existence, calling the old into question. In this changing economic environment, Old aristocratic privilege was making less and less sense. It still hung on because, for one thing, lots of wealthy non-nobles, they still wanted to attain noble titles and thus become nobles themselves. And most nobles still held on to their privileges very fiercely. And we've talked about how, because of marriage, many nobles and non-nobles had their feet in both worlds, old privilege and new wealth. 
But the old system of landed noble privilege was losing its hold on the French mind. And some people were asking what French society might look like if they got rid of noble privilege altogether. The Enlightenment. People always talk about how the Enlightenment ideas contributed to the French Revolution. But what Enlightenment ideas? Whose Enlightenment ideas? Well, the literacy rate in France was going up. And by 1789, almost half of men could read and almost a third of women could read. Enlightenment discussions that took place were exploding. In Lesson 164, we studied the salons, but they were also taking place in cafes and political meeting halls and masonry lodges and churches, etc. What was all of this reading and all of this disgusting doing to 18th century minds? Books were actually heavily censored by royal authority. Half of all books sold in France were published outside of France and smuggled in. In fact, almost all the Enlightenment bestsellers that we've talked about were published outside of France. Between 1750 and 1779, 40% of all the prisoners at the notorious Bastille Royal Prison were there because of their involvement in either writing, publishing, or selling books. Voltaire was sent to the Bastille twice. Voltaire's impact on the French Revolution. Keep in mind, Voltaire died in 1778, 11 years before the French Revolution started. Voltaire's writings about natural rights were important to the French Revolution, and this was ironic because Voltaire had been a monarchist and a friend of monarchs during his lifetime. In fact, he once said, I would rather be ruled by a single lion than by a thousand rats. He fiercely defended the rights of French Protestants who suffered religious persecution, but he was also very anti-Semitic, feeling that Jews could never be loyal Frenchmen. Voltaire also didn't think everyone should be taught to read. Denis Diderot's impact on the French Revolution, Diderot's Encyclopedia Project, took about 20 years to complete. The encyclopedia had over 100 philosoph contributions. D Diderot himself wrote about 6,000 of its 72,000 articles. But the encyclopedia was actually published in Switzerland and smuggled into France. And the encyclopedia popularized the idea that knowledge was for everyone, even secret knowledge, such things as how to dig a mine, for example, or how to make a button, or how to build your own printing press. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's impact on the French Revolution. Jean-Jacques Rousseau also died in 1778, like Voltaire, and as you'll remember, he published The Social Contract in 1762. And the first sentence had the reader hooked, because the very first sentence of that book was his famous quote, Man is born free, yet he is everywhere in chains. Rousseau's book asked this question. How can we create a society in which people are equal, moral, and free, but which is also unified and acts in the interest of everyone? And Rousseau had three main arguments. Number one, our contract had to be with one another, not with a ruler. Number two, our society should be governed by the general will expressed through the laws. And number three, all of this could only work if the citizens were truly moral. This is specifically how the Enlightenment paved the way for the French Revolution through Voltaire, Diderot, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The Enlightenment showed the flaws of the old regime, the state, and society. And the Enlightenment introduced powerful concepts that the French Revolution would use. Concepts like natural rights, the spread of knowledge, the general will. And the Enlightenment showed the power of the printed word and the discussion of that word. France's colonies. France's colonies brought great wealth to certain sectors of the French economy. 
but maintaining those colonies was too expensive for the French state to afford. Between 1689 and 1815, France and Britain fought seven major wars against each other for colonial control. And in the Seven Years' War, as we know, France and Britain fought each other in India, the Caribbean, the west coast of Africa, Canada, and the Atlantic. And losing that war left France humiliated and deep in debt. And as we have seen, French participation in global and colonial trade was destabilizing the entire system of noble privilege in France. It also caused a huge amount of human suffering for slaves, and those slaves were eventually going to revolt. All of France's colonies in India, Africa, North America, and the Caribbean were interconnected through slavery. If the global economy was a big machine, slavery was the grease that enabled it to run. No matter what kinds of products were traded, slavery connected them all. For example, Europe and Africa were both going through an Indian cotton and fabric craze. Indian cotton was also traded for slaves in Africa. Africans generally did not go around barely clothed. They wore lots of cotton cloth, top and bottom. Indian cotton also clothed the slaves in the Caribbean. Silks from India funded the purchase of slaves. Sugar and coffee were harvested by slaves. Spices funded the purchase of slaves. Food, like beef and grain and dried cod transported from French Canada, were used to feed slaves on plantations. There were three main ways that French colonies and global trade were connected to the French Revolution. Number one, as we have seen, the massive wealth produced by global trade was mostly gained by commoners rather than nobility. As these commoners got wealthier, traditional assumptions about privilege and hierarchy were challenged and disrupted. Even as certain people in France got wealthier, the French government got poorer, deeper in debt, and less able to run the country. The French Revolution eventually abolished slavery, but it didn't happen immediately. Of all of these French colonies, the Caribbean slave plantation system in the Sugar Islands was the most profitable. All the other French colonies supported this system. For example, France had fortified outposts in India where they bought huge amounts of cotton to finance and support slavery. There was a slave revolt in France's most important and profitable colony, Saint-Domingue, and that revolt caused many French revolutionaries to call an end to slavery. The American Revolution pushed France over the edge. One of Louis XVI's main foreign policy goals from the beginning of his reign was to find a way to get back at Britain for humiliating France in the Seven Years' War. Britain's trouble with its American colonies seemed like the perfect opportunity. The French Navy was great at distracting the British Navy from its war aims. Thousands of French troops made victory possible at the Battle of Yorktown and France supplied 90% of the revolutionary army's gunpowder. But at the same time, the French government was totally strapped for cash and constantly borrowing more. And in 1781, in the middle of the American Revolution, French finance minister Jacques Necker manipulated the French government's financial books and budgets to make it look as if France could afford to help the Americans. And this made Necker very popular with the people of France, but Jacques Necker's numbers were totally fake. Strangest of all about this whole thing was that here was an absolutist monarchy steeped in hierarchy and noble privilege, risking its own financial ruin and destruction in order to help a liberal republic with no noble class and which was built upon the principles of freedom inequality. That's how much the French hated Great Britain. That's also how the French monarchy speeded up its own fall. France's economic crisis. As we have seen, the French state had massive amounts of debt, and that debt grew every year. 
half of the French government's income was spent just paying the interest on its debt. The king had to pay a higher interest on that debt because he was considered a credit risk. And in 1783, Charles Alexandre de Cologne replaced the very conservative Jacques Necker as finance minister. And Cologne greatly increased royal spending, especially on infrastructure, in order to appear richer to potential creditors. And he encouraged nobles to spend a lot more on luxuries, just for appearances. Many non-nobles resented all of this spending by the nobles, and they especially resented Marie Antoinette. She did like to spend a lot of money. And by 1787, she had a nickname, Madame Deficit. France was also experiencing an economic turndown in two key economic sectors. Number one, agriculture. There had been bad weather and bad harvests, and these events included floods and drought, and this was affecting the grain supply, and it was causing the price of bread to increase greatly. In 1786, the harvest was terrible. In 1787, the harvest was a little better, but then in 1788, the harvest was so bad that it caused mass death, and grain riots started to happen across France. The other crisis sector in France was in manufacturing, and this was especially true in textiles. Adam Smith's liberal ideas that we learned about in Lesson 17.4 about laissez-faire and free trade and free enterprise being superior to mercantilism were gaining attention in France. And so finance minister Charles Alexandre de Cologne and foreign minister Charles Grevier Virgin decided to give Adam Smith's ideas a try to see if they could really improve the economic situation for France the way that Adam Smith said they would. And so they signed the Eden Treaty with Britain in 1786. This was a free trade agreement with Britain designed to end all of the bitter trade wars that the two countries had been having. But the Eden Treaty was a complete disaster for French textile manufacturing. Britain was having a new industrial revolution beginning with textiles, which we will study in tremendous detail after the break in chapter 20. French industry could not compete with the more cheaply produced British goods that flooded French markets, and many French manufacturers were wiped out. Unemployment in textiles and glass and earthenware, etc., skyrocketed in France because of the Eden Treaty. The Assembly of Notables, February 1787. For Finance Minister Shaw Alexandre de Cologne, there seemed to be only one way out of this crisis, and that was tax reform. Cologne had called a hand-picked Assembly of Notables to get backing and legitimacy for his tax reform plan. And these were 144 nobles, clergy, and even a couple of wealthy commoners. And Cologne had the complete support of King Louis XVI to do all of this. Cologne revealed to this group just how bad France's finances were. And these guys were in complete shock about the size of France's debt. They had believed Jacques Necker's false 1781 report, which had falsely said that France's finances were in great shape. Cologne proposed two new uni universal taxes that seemed to work well in Britain. The first was a universal land tax. Everyone, including nobles and clergy, would pay it. And of course, nobles and clergy rejected this idea completely. The second tax was a stamp tax on all commercial transactions. Merchants rejected that idea completely. With these two tax reform ideas, Cologne had dared to attack privilege. Louis XVI's own relatives organized against these reforms even while he himself was supporting them. And Louis XVI's own wife, Marie Antoinette, 
passed out circulars criticizing Cologne's tax reform plan. And all of this made the king look even more ineffective than he had before. Finance Minister Charles Alexandre de Cologne was fired and run out of France. As a result of all this, it was now public knowledge just how bad the financial situation was in France. Now everyone knew that Louis XVI was flat broke. And there was no way the king was going to get any more loans from the elite bankers of France. So the French elite now pressured the king to call an estates general. One of these had not been called since the year 1614. The act of calling the estates general was essentially asking the people of France what they thought the king should do. Many nobles saw the calling of an estates general as an opportunity. They thought they'd be able to exert their power against the king and force him to share power with them. They had no idea what was really going to happen. 